All right, so um, I hope you are able to appreciate in the activity that looking at the climate of Venus versus Mars, how their actual observed temperature compares to their equilibrium temperature can tell us how much greenhouse effect that planet is experiencing. And as you saw from the table with their atmospheric compositions and the total amount of atmosphere, both of those contribute to the overall greenhouse effect that those planets experience. So um, the greenhouse effect, just as an overview, um, greenhouse gases are gases that tend to absorb infrared light really well. So when infrared light tries to leave a planet, the greenhouse gases absorb it instead. And lots of different gases can act as greenhouse gases, um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone can all act as greenhouse gases. Um, oxygen gas and nitrogen gas do not. And um, the presence of greenhouse gases in an atmosphere means that some of the infrared light that escapes our atmosphere, if there was not very much CO2, instead gets trapped within the atmosphere because the CO2 absorbs it. And it doesn't just absorb that energy and hold on to it forever. Instead, it re-radiates that energy and some of it is re-radiated back into space, but some of it is re-radiated toward Earth. So now our complete picture of the energy budget needs to include this effect, the amount of radiation in the infrared trapped in our atmosphere. So now we have the sunlight hitting Earth minus the reflected sunlight, which you can figure out from a planet's albedo, has to be equal to the infrared light that's radiated by Earth minus the amount that gets trapped in the atmosphere. This is still a little bit of a simplified picture of the energy budget. The actual picture has a lot more flows of energy. Um, and if you're curious, I can point you to a good resource. All right, so the amount of IR radiation that gets trapped is directly related to the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So um, in this energy balance, the temperature, the equilibrium temperature of a planet is driven by how much total energy there is flowing. So if there's more energy in than out, the temperature will increase, causing more in energy to be lost by emitted infrared light, and the temperature increase will continue until the energy out equals the energy in. And on, in contrast, if there's more energy out than energy in, temperature will drop until there's less energy lost by the IR, and again, a balance will be reached. So one way to think about this is that the energy budget is like a seesaw, it's like a balance. Energy in it has to be equal to energy out. And if it becomes unbalanced, then temperature will respond until it comes back into balance. So for example, if the sun suddenly got way brighter and there were more sunlight hitting earth, then the situation would be unbalanced. We'd have more energy in than energy out. Or maybe we could consider if there's a lot more reflection, like if the entire surface of the earth were to be covered in snow and the oceans froze over, the albedo would go up and so the reflected sunlight would be larger and that would decrease the amount of energy in. If the earth was radiating more infrared because it reached a higher temperature, then we would have more energy out than energy in. And if we have more infrared radiation trapped in the atmosphere, that would decrease um, the energy out, there would be more energy in. Okay, so this is a picture of our earth in balance. Um, we need to consider all of these factors to keep the energy balance in place. And if any of these factors changes, there will be a response in the system. So this brings us to our changing climate. Um, there's one important difference between weather and climate, which is that climate is a long-term average. It's a long-term condition, whereas weather is a short-term fluctuation. And climate is what you expect, weather is what you get is one kind of simple quote to keep those um, separate. And uh, the climate, there's lots of different ways to measure the condition of a climate. And we use global average temperature as one such marker. So even though there's different temperatures all over the surface of the earth, if you take an average temperature and then track how that changes over time, then we can see how climate has changed throughout the earth's history. And it has changed many times. And we're currently in a period of accelerating change. So 
um, climate change that we're experiencing now is due to an increase in CO2 in our atmosphere. So essentially we have more CO2 in the atmosphere that we've been taking out of the ground where it's been trapped as fossil fuels and then burning and therefore injecting into the atmosphere. And because of this increase in our CO2, uh, the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, there's more infrared radiation that's trapped. So this is going to shift Earth out of energy balance and cause uh, an unbalancing that then something has to change in the system to restore. So what happens is that because there's now more energy that is staying in Earth rather than escaping into space, um, the temperature increases. And this over time will cause Earth to emit more infrared light from its surface until we come back to a new balance at a higher equilibrium temperature. So just some questions to test that idea of the balance. What do you suppose would happen to the temperature of the Earth if its albedo were to increase? Yeah, I see a majority of votes for the albedo increasing would tend to decrease Earth's surface temperature. And this can be understood using, again, our energy balance equation. If our albedo goes up, meaning we're more reflective, then the amount of reflected sunlight would increase. And so that means that the temperature would decrease and the infrared light radiated by Earth would decrease in turn. All right, so if we had a larger albedo, um, we could unbalance the energy budget and then the amount of infrared rated, light rated by Earth would decrease and we would reach a new lower equilibrium temperature. So there's lots of ways that these elements in the system can change. Let's think about this one. What happens if a higher energy flux of energy from the sun hits the Earth? Like if we suddenly moved closer from to the sun, what would happen? And I am seeing unanimous votes for it would get hotter if the earth moved closer to the sun. Yes, exactly. So if the earth received more sun, sunlight, this could happen if we moved closer or if the sun got a lot brighter. Um, then in that case, the sunlight hitting Earth would increase, and therefore, on the other side of the equation, the temperature would increase, and so would the light rated by Earth. So in this case, a higher sunlight in would unbalance us until our temperature increased, and more infrared light would then be radiated until we reached equilibrium again. All right, so I think we've talked about all three of these levers. So notice that in all cases, if the Earth's energy input and output is unbalanced, the temperature is what changes until we drive uh, the situation back to balance. So if we have more energy in than out, we get higher temperatures, which creates more infrared light radiated to decrease the energy. Uh, if there's more energy escaping than entering, then we reach lower temps and we have less IR light radiated to space. So that is essentially the, the system at work. So anytime you're unbalanced, regardless of which direction it goes, the temperature of Earth adjusts until we're rebalanced. So here's what's happening today. Um, if we look at the um, atmospheric carbon dioxide, there's lots of different ways that historic carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are measured. Um, going back about 800,000 years, there have been definitely fluctuations up and down um, due to changes in the Earth's vegetation, changes in weathering, uh, et cetera. But in the industrial age, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide has boosted a lot because we are the first species in the history of the planet to dig up fossil fuels and burn them for our industrial needs. So this is what's going on with the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere today. Um, NASA's website has a whole bunch more information if you're curious on how this is happening. Um, and there was actually a physics Nobel Prize awarded just last week. Um, so this year's Nobel Prize, half of it went jointly to these two folks for the physical modeling of Earth's climate, which quantifies the variability and reliably predicts global warming. So if you're curious about that, um, I think this APS article is actually a pretty good one. So 
climate modeling is um, quite robust at this point. It's a lot different than weather modeling because the system uh, over long periods of time is much easier to um, measure and model than the very short-term fluctuations that we see in the weather. Um, let's see. I think that's all I had to say about this. I didn't label this, but the blue is uh, what our temperature would be expected to be if the only sources of CO2 added to the atmosphere came from volcanoes. And then the red is the model that includes fossil fuels, and the black is the actual measured temperature. <laughs>